Live from the studio at the Northwest Florida School of Biblical Studies, this is Have a Bible Question, where you are part of the program. You can help make tonight's program a great success by liking and sharing this page on Facebook and subscribing to our channel on YouTube. We want you to submit your questions here online on our Facebook page or on our YouTube channel. There is also a form on our website at haveabiblequestion.com or email questions at haveabiblequestion.com. Questions submitted through the online form and email will be kept anonymous. We ask everyone to please be kind and loving with their comments and questions on all formats available. All questions that are answered on this program will be made available afterward on our YouTube channel so that you can like and share. A podcast is also available after the program airs. Have a Bible Question is a work of the Northwest Florida School of Biblical Studies and is hosted by Guyton Montgomery, director of the school and the preacher at the Church of Christ at Milestone. It is co-hosted by Troy Spradlin, the preacher at the Margaret Street Church of Christ, along with our YouTube editor, Jeff Orr, the preacher at the Church of Christ in Cantonment, and our live video editor, Ray Brantley, the associate live from the studio. All right, Troy, that was my fault. I hit play on the wrong one. <laughs> when we get a new a new sound bite to be able to start the show, and then uh, when, when you have more than one and you push the wrong button, that's what happens sometimes. You know it. Uh, <laughs> that's why you throw away that which is bad. You don't hold on to it. You don't hold on to it. How are you doing tonight, Troy? I'm doing great. Doing great. Good to see several on here. I see Jack's with us. Stephen Fulton's with us. Several others. Great to have you with us tonight. How do you see that? I don't. I don't see anybody. I have a special uh, page here that shows only for me. No, I'm just. Do kidding. you really? No, wow, you are Pat so Mency special. is on here. Good to see you. I think it has to do with just the feed sometimes that you're friends with them and I'm not or something. Maybe I could. Maybe be. because I'm on the I have a Bible question page. Th there you go. The page that yep. would do it. I'm doing great, brother. It's good to be here. Good. As I always say, I enjoy coming over here. I look forward to this time. It's always good discussion and uh happy to be a part of it yeah I, it's a it's a favorite of my week jeff how are you doing i am doing just fine brother you had some good supper tonight in your daughter's house uh yes and uh they they call it crack slaw but it's kind of like it's not crack cocaine in there right no it, it's actually the uh the components that make up a spring roll except mm -hmm. it's not in the spring roll it's in the bowl and it's it is delicious so it's minus the fried goodness huh uh yeah minus the bad stuff okay yeah that's that's bad for you but tastes good yeah <laughs> ray you doing all right tonight <laughs> oh yeah i'm doing good over here how about you i'm oh, doing great it's good to see uh, each one that's joined us tonight a uh, little change in format we're going to end at 7 30 normally we go to 8 30 but there is a presidential uh debate that's taking place and we were talking about it and you know, uh, we are privileged in America. We're not saying that that is more important than studying the Bible, uh, but we are privileged in America to have the right to vote, and it's good to be informed. We know a lot of our viewers of this program will be wanting to watch the debate this evening. We would like to, to be better informed as voters. And uh, so uh, we're going to end at 7.30 tonight to give us just a little bit more time and uh, help us out. When you have a weekly program every single week for two hours, Sometimes you need to adjust just a little bit. And so we're going to do that tonight. Uh, Alan Jury. Hey, he's on there. Now I'm starting to see people. Facebook felt sorry for me. <laughs> Andrea says he never sees me. <laughs> Did you ever finally say hi to your wife on here? Uh, I say hi to my wife every day. Do and you? So, yep. And yeah. she's the highlight of my life. So oh. I'm definitely going to say hello. How sweet. How sweet. <laughs> All right. We need your Bible questions uh, submitted. Uh, remember this. Uh, we don't We don't really plan this out ahead of time. Yeah, that's the thing about this show is that, uh, you know, we want to answer your questions, and, and your participation is what makes the show what it is, and so or this program what it is, I should say. And so your Bible questions are always 
answered literally when we get them in because that's part of it. I think that's what makes this program more realistic and more appealing is the fact that it's just Bible preachers. We're all friends here. We all uh, do things together and communicate together quite often, and, and we have all studied. And so we have our backgrounds are able to blend and answer your questions. And so please, you can submit your questions right here on the Facebook page. You can also go to haveabiblequestion.com, and on that page there's a form that you can fill out and remain anonymous. You can email us. You can text Guyton or myself if you have our cell phone numbers. And uh, we would love to answer your questions. That's what this program is all about. We just have an hour tonight, so let's jump right into it. Um, Yeah, if they send us a question, <laughs> then we'll be able to. Now, um, hey, I got asked a question today. I thought that was very interesting. A uh, man wanted to know if I knew what language that Jesus spoke. Uh, He spoke. He didn't speak the King's English. Was it King James English? No, he didn't. He well, didn't use the King James Bible either. What about Paul? Paul didn't <laughs> speak or write King James English. No, no, not at all. I'm I'm confused now. Uh, you know, we we say that jokingly, but you know, a lot of people forget that that um, you know, it's not English language. But uh, I was um, answered him. I said, well, it would have been the Greek language, and he was like. Hey, you got that right. <laughs> I was like, I hope I did. I always hate it when they test the preacher, you know, type thing. You stop and think about it. That is kind of interesting, you know, to think that Jesus spoke Greek, you know, and that, that now he also spoke Aramaic, Aramaic as well. And, and Hebrew, mm -hmm. he speak Hebrew, uh, but you see that in Paul, you know, Paul did that. He would be speaking to, uh, the jailer or the, was it the guard there at Antonio Fortress? He was clearly speaking in Greek. And then he turned right around to the people and started speaking to them in Hebrew. And so clearly you see multilingual people in the Bible. Right. You might have the answer to this. I don't know. Um, but uh, I wonder sometimes how much of the Hebrew, uh, I, I know they used it some, but we know of uh, Jesus quoting from the Septuagint, which was the Greek translation of the right. um, Old Testament Hebrew. Uh -huh. It, it kind of makes you wonder how much were they actually using the Hebrew language during their time. Uh, we know it being the language of the Hebrew of, of the Jewish people, but um, obviously they were using the Greek a lot, using the Greek a lot. And I believe in the synagogues and in a lot of the Jewish uh, worship that they were doing, they were speaking Hebrew mm -hmm. and there, and then of course, Aramaic being mixed in there as well. You know, whenever you see that in uh, on when Jesus is on the cross and he says, uh, Lama Sabachthani, Mm -hmm. Eloi, Eloi, Lama Sabachthani. Yeah, that's Aramaic, right? Mm -hmm. if I'm not mistaken. So I, I, that's one thing I love about the Bible. And that, that is one of the reasons, the main reasons why I often set, tell every single Christian, you should know some Greek. You should learn some Greek. You, not, you don't need to be proficient in it and, and be able to speak it because nobody knows how Koine Greek is actually spoken. But you should know some of the main words and some of the main ways it works and things like that. But then the question comes, you know, how do I how do I learn some of that? You know, there's some references. I always encourage people. Strong uh, concordance mm -hmm. is a good one to have, and you can get a uh, digital version online for free. That's right. Um, it, it's it, it's something though about picking up that big old book uh, and, and being able to look up words in it. Um, yeah. But if you have that, uh, a there's that it's numbered to Strong's can be useful uh -huh. as well as being able to um, be able to. Uh, a Vines Expository Dictionary. Yes, a that's lot. a great. That's a great one. I love that. And so you know, people say, "Oh, I'm not going to learn Greek." Well, you don't have to really learn Greek. No. You just know how to look these things up. I was able to show somebody a word earlier, uh, you know, and show them the compound, how it makes, and how it was able to give a better definition. Uh, I was thinking about in First Timothy. I was recording a video for class. It was talking about uh, to put the brethren in remembrance. Mm -hmm. Well, put in remembrance is actually one word. Yes. <laughs> Rather than, and it looks like it would be separate words with brethren being in the middle of it, but it would really be the idea of put in remembrance the brethren. But that word for put in remembrance, when you look it up, is actually put the legs under something. Wow. And so whenever it's talking about put in remembrance these things, these teachings, is is like put the legs under the brethren. That's so awesome. So that they can stand upon have a foundation upon which to stand. And so it just brings that scripture to light in a better way. And that's the mm -hmm. beauty of the Greek. There's so many wonderful little, I call them nuggets like that. There's little 
nuggets of wisdom in there, like uh, in Romans chapter 12, verse 2, whenever it says we need to be transformed. Oh, uh, yeah. That's Met- the metamorphosis. word metamorpho. Okay. Where we get our word metamorphosis, which really gives you a, a deeper sense and idea of what it means to be transformed and your mind being transformed. And there it is on the screen and be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. So think about that, that metamorphosized, if you will, of your mind. That's a, just one of those little nuggets that, that you can learn from the Greek. Exactly. You know, the, the in-depthness to Bible study, um, you know, just a lot of times, you know, do we want just a surface understanding of something exactly. or do we want to know more about it? It's kind of like a car. Honestly, if I can stick the key in the ignition and turn it and it crank up and drive, I'm happy. Uh, but, you know, there's people that say, no, I want to know what's engine in it, what kind of oils in that engine, you know, and, and all the details of it. Guyton, the Bible is the most important book in all the world. Why wouldn't you want to know more about that? Exactly. Hey, we got a question come in from Tina Murray here. Good to see you on here, Tina. It says, to be saved, I know you have to admit that you're a sinner. Uh, believe Jesus died and rose again and commit your life to Christ to be saved. How do I truly know if, if I believe Jesus died and rose again? Uh, let's back up on that and just kind of break it down as we go about what it is we have to do to be saved. She mentioned to know that you have to admit that you're a sinner. That is kind of the starting place uh, to understand the idea of accountability and that sin is what separates us from God, Isaiah 59, verse 1 verse um, through 2. Yes, um, and you see an example of that in Acts chapter 2, verse 37. And brethren, what shall we do? Yeah, you see that they recognized their guilt. They recognized that they were sinning. All right, and you know it says believe Jesus died and rose again. That is a part of the belief system that you have to have, but I want to. I would argue that faith is a little bit more than that. Hebrews 11, 6, faith. Without faith, it's impossible to please him. And, and faith is that which is produced by the word of God, Romans chapter 10. Uh, what is it? Verse 10 with the heart. Man, uh, so the faith cometh by hearing him. By the 17. Word of God. 17. Thank yeah. you. Uh, confession is, is 10, verse 10. I always, That's yeah, right. Flip That's right. those two. Yeah. You know, and, and you have to have belief that Jesus existed. That was in Acts chapter 2 because uh, that whole sermon was about Jesus was proven among you. You crucified him. Yeah, they saw him. They knew what happened. They were witnesses, and that's why they felt that way. And he laid out who Jesus was. So he created that that explanation, and there is belief now that yep. comes out of that, recognizing their situation that they were their soul was in danger. And you can't continue in sin. Romans chapter six. Uh, shall we that or shall we that are dead to sin continue? Ah, I can't get it right. Romans chapter six. Well, yeah. Um. So we that are dead to sin live any longer therein, God for <sighs> Yeah, God forbid. That's Romans six one to two. Yeah, but I'm getting the quotation wrong, Jeff. Yeah. Can you oh. fix it for me? Uh, <laughs> no, we can't. What shall we say, say then? Shall we continue yeah. in sin that grace may abound? God forbid, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Yeah. Yeah. And so, you know, when you when you think about that idea is that you can't continue on in sin, so there's a repentance, Luke thirteen three, turning from that sin that you're in. And so that's part of that admitting you're a sinner, turning from that. The confessing Jesus Christ is believing that he died and rose again. And, of course, if you're going to be washed in the blood of Jesus uh, through baptism, you have to believe in that. So the question comes. So did, I think we covered everything about how to become a child of God, to get into that saved condition that you're in in Christ Jesus our Lord. Um, so the question then really is how do I truly know if I believe Jesus died and rose again. Uh, that can be a little challenging uh, to some degree for me to answer because ultimately that's something you've got to make up in your mind. Now, how can we know that he did it? We could answer. Uh, Troy, you got ideas on that? Well, there's a couple of things. First John chapter five comes to mind and uh, John writes in first John five or thing, uh, 13, he says, these things I have written to you who believe in the manner of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life and that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. Now, you need to understand context always is so important. At the beginning of that, he wrote, whoever, chapter 5, verse 1, whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. I think that's where you were going just a second ago. 
is there's there's more to just believing. Exactly. There there's belief and and there's being born again. It, it doesn't just stop at belief. It does, just like it doesn't stop at repentance. It doesn't stop at confession. It, you have to go through the entire the entire uh, uh, phases. It's kind of like what I like to say a lot of times. It's kind of like opening a safe. Mm-hmm. You know, if you're going to get something out of a safe, you have to go through all the steps. You turn to the left, you turn to the right, you turn to the left, you open the door, then you reach in and get what's in there. Same way with this is you have to hear, believe, confess, be baptized, and then you're added to the church. John is saying, if you've done that, and then he says a key thing, for this is the love of God that we keep his commandments, and that's how he says we know. We know that we love God. God, we know that we are saved if we keep his commandments. So it's that walking in that newness of life that we talked about, keeping the commands of God. If you love me, John 14, 15, keep my commandments. So, you know, and I look at the question and, you know, I love the way questions come in sometimes because we can see them differently. You know, how do I know? Mm -hmm. Um, If I ask, if I ask that question, you know, or am I asking that question? Because I think about that, that song that we sometimes sing, I believe in a hill called Mount Calvary. I believe that uh, he died for you and me. I forget all the words to that song, but it's talking about that confidence that we have. Mm -hmm. Well, that belief, that confidence comes from the word of God. And so if I'm questioning whether I truly believe or not, then what I'd say a person has to do is go back to the word of God and start studying more. Now that may be that maybe you read about the death, the burial, and the resurrection, but you need to read more about uh, about it and understand all the evidence like the fact that he went into that upper room or that room where they were assembled afterwards and even ate with his disciples. Yeah, exactly. And so you notice about the road to Aramaeus and how he revealed himself to them. <laughs> and that's a, an amazing event when he was walking with them. He, he, they didn't know who he was, but right. then finally he made himself to be known to them and they knew instantly that this was Jesus. Right. And so you may need to read more about that. It may be you need to go back and read more about the Bible and how you can have confidence in that the Bible is true. Uh, you know, to so to answer that, how do I truly know if I believe Jesus died and rose again? I'd say it has to go back to Bible study and learning more about the Scripture because the more I read the Scripture, the more confident I get in my belief that Jesus died and rose again. Yeah, and I would add, you could also put in Christian evidences, there's the historicity of Jesus Christ that can oh, yes. add to your faith. But Tina, you got the exact same question. You have the exact same question that Thomas had in oh, yes. John chapter 20. Thomas said, unless I see in his hands the print of his nails and put in the fin- put my finger into the, the print of those nails and put my hand in his side, I will not believe. Well, then Jesus, of course, comes and he says here, you know, Thomas, he says, touch my hands and put your, put your hand in my side. But here's the beautiful side of that. And this is why belief is so very important. He says, Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. But listen to it. He says, blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Tina, your belief in Jesus is the most important step of faith. And so you have to, you have to make that decision yourself. It comes down to whether or not you want to accept what's written here and the evidence or not. And so and let me say, I, th- I think there's a lot of people that probably say they believe and haven't truly weighed the evidence, Troy. Uh, and that's just the surface level, yeah, weak yeah. faith that, that isn't yeah. a true faith. And, and um, you know, there may be other people watching this that need to really look deeper into them. Why do I believe this? Do I believe it just because mom and daddy told me? Or do I believe it because I've searched it and I've, I've studied the scriptures? I love that right. because when I fell away from the church, and then decided to come back to the church, the first thing I remember telling my wife is, I'm not going to just believe for the sake of believing. I want to know. And And that's when she told you what to believe. (laughs) No, I'm just kidding. (laughs) And I studied. I studied. That's the thing. You study and you learn and you grow that way. Right. Jeff? Well, there's a difference between knowing the facts and then personalizing those facts to your situation. And that's, that's really what we're talking about here. We're saying, uh, yes, this is what happened. What do I do about it? And, Mm -hmm. uh, and in first Corinthians chapter 15, Paul went into detail talking about the proof of his resurrection by 
bringing up witnesses about being seen of Cephas, uh, and then of the 12 and, uh, above 500 at once. And, and Paul was doing this because there were those that were doubting that there would be a final resurrection, which in turn denied that Jesus resurrected from the dead. And so he was answering that question. So the, the proof is there. It's just a matter of believing and accepting them and applying it personally. Actually to taking lives. the yeah. time to look at the evidence that's right. been offered. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, great question, uh, Tina. We appreciate that. Kristen Hunt, good to see you on here. We miss seeing you guys. Hopefully we can work in a trip, uh, visit y'all before long. Oscar Lachlan has a great question on here, but because we're going to be ending early, I want to go ahead and go to break and we're going to come back and start with that in just one moment. But I do want to go ahead and let some people see, uh, about the good works that goes on with like good news today and the congregations that make this program possible. Throughout history, the path of life has been for most an unknown path. The struggle of mankind to find meaning, to know from where we came, to ultimately know where we'll end up. Questions like, is there a God? Or what would God have me to do? All these questions can have an answer if we know where to look. The Bible. At Milestone, we offer biblical worship, Bible classes, website resources, and more. Learn more about us at cocmilestone.com. Check out our Facebook page, or better yet, visit us in person. We hope you're enjoying the program, but here's a question for you. Do you live in the Milton Pace area and want to know more about Jesus? If so, then we invite you to the Margaret Street Church of Christ in Milton, Florida. We're a loving family striving to know Jesus and follow His teachings in the New Testament. We offer classes and activities for all ages of children and youth, verse-by-verse -verse Bible study for adults, and family-based events throughout the year. Check us out at MargaretStreetChurchOfChrist.org or on social media. Come see what our Margaret Street family is all about. Your life will be blessed. The streets that are purest gold. Hello, I'm Mark Teske, the co-producer of the Good News Today program, and we're excited to be partners with Have a Bible Question. If you're enjoying tonight's program, we invite you to watch Good News Today. Have a Bible Question is a part of each and every program. Uh, that we have available. We're on in markets all over the country, so if you come to our website, gnttv.org, you can see the television station in your area. Again, thanks for watching. We appreciate you. All right, we're back. Uh, I almost was singing. Yeah, almost. <laughs> we'll get back. We, like, we like the fact that they have that song, Good News, Good News. It'd be great to have have a bible question something like that yeah, we gotta get we gotta work on that yeah okay you um, know what oscar speaking of oscar here we're going to his question oscar plays a banjo we could get no we could, <laughs> no <laughs> i can see the complaints I'm already just, I, I i did that because i can just see oscar embarrassed right now listen he's a good friend of mine does he have so a pair of overalls that. oh you know it you oh, know it. oh all right uh, Oscar Lachlan writes in proper hermeneutics is critical. Uh, I agree. Um, I know command, uh, authorized example, necessary inference is the proper way to interpret the Bible. How did men arrive at this reasoning? Can you give a thumbnail sketch of how we got there? All right. Here we are at eight 30 now. <laughs> um, we can do this. Yeah, we can hermeneutics. Let's start with that though. What is hermeneutics? It's the science and study of interpretation. That's right. And it, hermeneutics applies to more than just the Bible. It does. Um, you know, when people talk about, well, that's just your interpretation or my interpretation, we need to understand there's only one true correct interpretation, and that is to know what the author of something intended when they sent it. Mm -hmm. And in reality, we use hermeneutics even when we get text messages, <laughs> we sure do, don't we? You know, because we'll get a message and we instantly ask some, because there's more rules. This is really how do we derive authority, but there's, there's principles behind interpretation that we're asked, like, who wrote it? When did they write it? <laughs> to whom was it sent? Because sometimes I got an email one time that a church member wrote to uh, a former preacher and it was complaining about me. And, uh, you know, I get this email, I'm reading it. I'm like, who sent this? When did they send this? Who, who were they? 
who do they mean to send this to? Because <laughs> yeah. I could tell it wasn't supposed to be about me. <laughs> sent to me. That was one of those when you push the send button and then you're like, oh. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, it, because what are you doing? You're interpreting. You're trying to figure out what was the intended meaning of a message. And so that's when we talk about hermeneutics. It's that science and study of interpretation. And so uh, anything you want to add on that as far as what is hermeneutics? You think that? Okay. Uh, and I think we had to answer that that question so we can have everybody together for this next part. Um, because he goes and he talks about command, authorized example, necessary inference is a proper way to interpret the Bible. I want to qualify that just a little bit. It's probably because of the way you were typing. Um, but when we say that, it's how do we derive authority from the Bible? Because there's a lot more principles than just that. It's how do we ascertain authority? authority yeah how do we know what applies to us and what doesn't apply to us that's the question and that's how men were able to get to that idea of, of hermeneutics because even in hermeneutics going back to that principle uh there's a little bit more to it than this because it's not just is there an example or necessary inference or command when because we have to understand that the old testament law law of moses for instance was never given to us and so when we just see a command it doesn't necessarily even though it's in the Bible, doesn't apply. So we're going to go, all right, we're under the New Testament law, the law of Christ. And so now we're looking to New Testament commands, examples, and necessary inferences, right? Mm -hmm. All right, so, uh, and, and, and Oscar, I know you know a lot of this stuff. Uh, you've heard it through the years and taught and all that, but I uh, want to make sure everybody's on the same page. So this, uh, and some people refer to this as the, uh, in, E N I C N E N C I. Anyway, they come up C C E N I hermeneutics command example necessary. And they, we have to put letters to everything now. And so that'll be like C E N I. And so the question really is how did we get to this reasoning? How did men get to that point? Um, you want to take it from there, Troy? <laughs> <laughs> now, the, the key thing he said, there is thumbnail sketch and just getting to that part took a little bit, uh, in a nutshell, in a nutshell, basically, the way we got to where we are today in the Church of Christ doing that started back during the Restoration Movement. Whenever there were men, that was a time whenever uh, there was widespread intellect that was coming about, an awakening, if you will, when people were opening their Bibles and trying to figure things out. And it, a lot of it came as a response to those that were coming out of the Catholic Church and beginning their Protestant denominations, and there were all kinds of questions. Well, then you have people like the Campbells and Stones and, and other people. It's not just Campbell and Stone who really started trying to figure out how do we apply, you know, what, well, let me rephrase that, how do we know what applies to us and what doesn't? And so, therefore, they began to put that together, and that's where phrases came from, like let's call things by Bible names and do things in Bible ways. That's another way of saying examples and inferences and commands. Exactly. Now, some people want to go back to that restoration, and they want to say, well, you know, this is something the Church of Christ came up with on the CENI, um, and, and they really throw that around as insulting. Uh, right, and it's not true because there's other examples of it happening before that. Acts chapter 15 is one that's often cited. I was trying to find it here um, where the early disciples needed to answer questions of the necessity of circumcision for Gentile Christians. Uh, it's in, in this exact situation. I'm going to quote from an article here that uh, Peter cited his experience at Cornelius' house, concluding from the fact that the Gentiles there received the Holy Spirit, that God acknowledged them, made no distinction between Jew and Gentiles chapter 15 verse 7 through 9 god never explicitly stated that conclusion it was something that he saw through example and he took that in connection with the commands that they'd been given the example they had they came to the necessary inference that they were not to command circumcision of the gentile people so we could actually go to acts 15 and see that concept of uh here's commands here's examples now what's the necessary inference and one of the things that a lot of people mess up is they think um, expediency and necessary inference can happen uh, apart from commands. And that's where we got to be careful because yeah. you've got to have the commands that uh, help us to understand the necessary inference. That's right. 
And I'm glad you went all the way back to Acts chapter 15, which takes us right back to the age of the New Testament. And then we even see that man understood these principles uh, in history, history outside and a part of the Church of Christ. And what comes to my mind is around, was it 335, right around there, the Nicene Council? 325. 325, thank you. No problem. The Nicene Council, uh, that was what they were doing. They were trying to interpret the Scriptures uh, for a certain answer and for certain questions that they had. And so you see men doing it even you know, just a couple of hundred years after the New Testament was finished. Exactly. So um, we see it in the church heavily from the Restoration Movement because it's like this resurrection of, hey, wait a minute, we have the Bible. We need to go back doing just what the Bible says. We can do it when we follow these principles. That's right. But these principles have been implemented through throughout the ages. Now, to go beyond Acts 15, I'd have to go pull out a history book. <laughs> right, right. Because I'd be willing to say that it actually probably exists. Now, in the church, often we use, um, uh, what's the book we, we use? Dungan. Uh, Dungan. Dungan, yeah. I, I saw her say Dungan, but I've, I had uh, Dugan's uh, cleaning the floor today here at the church building, so I was really confused. Uh, Dungan's book on hermeneutics is uh, kind of one of those standards, and, but there's, there's a lot more than that. Though. Yeah, Thomas Warren has one that says, how do we know a Bible is, uh, example, has, what's the title? Something. When is, when is an example binding? Uh, yes, yeah. and that's a great, great one there. You know, there's also, we need to be sure and, and let people understand that there is also a teaching out there that's called the new hermeneutic. Okay. And that's, that's a scary thing because this is an important point that Oscar brings out. How do we get here? Well, the sad part is, is that man is now... When I say man, I'm talking about scholars and theologian stuff are going beyond this idea of command, example, and necessary inference. They're now changing things a little bit and what's now called this new hermeneutic. And not only that, but you have what we call traditionalism because traditionalism comes out, uh, especially within Catholicism and Greek Orthodox Mm. and things that they want to say, well, if the early church fathers did it, then that makes it okay. Right. Uh, well, we actually try and go back to the Bible because the Bible is actually from God. Just because an early church father does it doesn't make it right. Um, just because it's been done for a long time doesn't make it right. We want the authority of Scripture, which is able to thoroughly equip man for every good work. Uh, 2 Timothy 2, 15, 3, 16, 17, given by the inspiration of God. Uh, and that's why we try and go to it and derive biblical authority. Oscar, tell us how we're doing, whether or not we're given that <laughs> brief sketch, if we're getting to the crux of the matter or not. Uh, that was more of an eight by 10 painting instead, or, you know, instead of a thumbnail there, Oscar, but you know, we did the best we could. So. <laughs> yep. uh, but I, I love these questions because, you know, we start out the program and we got time to answer your question. I thought that might take a little longer. We did a little better than I thought we would on that one. Yeah. Uh, so we still got time for your questions. If you want to submit them to us. Um, do it right here through email or text, and we'll get to it tonight. We are ending early, early at 7.30, but we got time until then to answer some questions. But anyway, I, I had no idea at the start that we should be talking about hermeneutics tonight. <laughs> uh, hey, Ray, got a question for you. You remember our friend? Uh, we have a lot of friends. You have to be more specific. <laughs> you know, you know. every time we talk about hermeneutics, what would he say? Oh, yeah. Oh, uh, what was his name? Uh, Mr. Uh, Hermeneutics. Let me introduce you to my friend. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, do you know my friend, Herman Nudics? <laughs> was that one of your professors or something? Or, uh, no, it was a former student. Oh, uh, okay. <laughs> was no longer. All right, I was looking maybe for the reasoning steps to arrive at those conclusions. Um, I oh, turned okay. off the feed to comment on my phone. <laughs> All right. Uh, you know, Certainly command, and when we think about that, uh, let me run here, um, 2 Timothy, or 1 Timothy chapter 4 could be a good thing, because when we think about commands, uh, I'm trying to find it here real quick. Uh, give me just a second. Oh, verse 11. These things command and teach, even in, within the word, uh, it's the idea that there are teachings of the new testament that are given as commands and the word for command there i don't have my notes in front of me but it's actually something that is authoritative within the word itself and so it's saying it has the authority in order to demand somebody to adhere and so from the new testament itself we get the idea of command 
And so I take that one. Now, the example, the way we get to that, that one, why we would say example, going back to Acts 15 on that, is that he saw a biblical concept that the Holy Spirit came down in Acts chapter 10 on the house of Cornelius, who was a um, Gentile. And so to him, even though there was not a command of the Gentiles receiving the baptism at that point, he had this example that they could receive, they could be added to the church without, without a circumcision. And so to him, it said, all right, here's the commands that the gospel is to go into every creature, Matthew, Mark 16, 15, 16, Matthew chapter 28, 18 through 20. But as far as what do we do about the Gentiles who aren't circumcised? Do we need to have them circumcised? But there's, there was no command or scripture to say the Gentile shall not be circumcised in order to enter into the church. There was no direct command of that. But what they did in Acts 15 was look to the case of Cornelius and say, because God showed the spirit to them or gave the spirit to them, obviously that is the example we need to show that they don't have to be baptized, uh, excuse me, have to be circumcised in order to be saved. And so when we see an example that's approved of God, now we can see a lot of examples that aren't approved of God, <laughs> and that would actually help us to know that, hey, this isn't right, and we can't use that for authority. Mm -hmm. um, so hopefully that helps in that. Now necessary inference, we, when we get a necessary inference, it's kind of like, well, the Bible hasn't given us an example hasn't given us a command, but it's necessarily inferred that we have to to have certain things in order to carry out those commands and examples. Singing would be a prime example of that, in my opinion, Troy. Um, we don't have specific songs. Uh, we do know Psalms, hymns, spiritual songs based off Ephesians 5.19. We have examples of them singing Psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, but the exact song we have to sing um, isn't necessarily commanded so that's where it's we know it's got to be with the heart but um my favorite uh necessary inference is in acts chapter eight. Oh yes whenever philip was preaching to the ethiopian eunuch and it says he began with this scripture and he preached jesus to him the very next verse the ethiopian eunuch says here's water what prevents me from being baptized well nowhere between that verse and him saying that does it say anything about baptism is a command in that particular passage and yet we can infer that baptism is part of the preaching of Jesus. I have some information about he's asking you know how do we get how do we arrive at this? Mm -hmm. Goes back to what we were saying earlier about the enlightenment period or Yes. The Reformation, really, going back right around the 1500s to 1600s, you see a wide range of philosophers. And when we talk about philosophers, back then, their primary thing they were dealing with was theology. It's mm -hmm. not like today when we talk about philosophy. They were dealing with theology and trying to interpret Scripture because there was all this. That That's how the Reformation movement came about. So... Uh, Oscar's question is how, how did we get the reasoning steps to arrive at these conclusions? It began back in that reformation time. It did. Oh, that Coke was catching up to me. I'm sorry. <laughs> I thought maybe he was giving me a secret signal or something. No, no, no. I was, uh, I was just having a little bit of trouble there. Uh, but, uh, no, I mean, it, you're exactly right. It's that pursuit for trying to know how, uh, to interpret. And, and, and some of it is, is logical. Yes, it's just it's just it's it's been around. It's kind of like yeah. laws. These principles are there, and uh, to try and finger point and say this is where it is. But like the necessary inference, I I think a lot about the application of that because where's our authority for a baptistry? Yeah, yeah. Um, that's a prime. All right, there's a command in order to baptize. Uh, we have the examples of it require a uh, command that it requires water. Uh, examples it requires much water in order to do so we know the reasoning for it and all that but as far as the exact location and you know there, there's nothing to say it's got to be a, a creek a river or in some parts of our country a creek um <laughs> you know a, a pool or if it wants to be a bathtub a horse trough 
that's not specified. We don't have a specific command or example. Now, if it had said it has to be a horse trough, then we'd use a horse trough, wouldn't we? That's exactly. I have used a horse trough before. <laughs> but so when we say necessary inferences, the necessary inference is that it's got to be a body of water enough to immerse a person. The container doesn't really matter. So if it wants to be a fiberglass baptistry at the front, then we can necessarily infer uh, the authority to be able to hold water somewhere to be able to fulfill the command and follow the example that we have. That's right. Going right. back to the Bible, as you did with Acts chapter 15, we have an example of this of the early church trying to deal with Bible interpretation, with scriptural interpretation. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, beginning in verse 6, you see that apparently that church was having some issues trying to determine what it was Paul had taught them. So that's why he writes this letter to him. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, beginning in verse 6, he says, But we command you, uh, there it is. There's command. We command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you withdraw from every brother who walks disorderly and not according to the tradition which he received from us. Now, the question there is apparently, or the inferred question is, well, what do you mean, Paul? What, uh, we don't understand what you're talking about. Well, look at the next verse. For you yourselves know how you ought to follow us, for we were not disorderly among you, nor do we eat anyone's bread free of charge, but work with labor and toil night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you, not because we do not have authority, verse 9, but to make ourselves an example of how you should follow us. So the Thessalonians were having a question about well, how do we interpret this? And he's saying, look, we have the authority, the command to give you that. And not only that, but you have an example to follow. And so there's just kind of a, a little synopsis there that even in, Bi again, another op another example from Bible times of how they're having to work through uh, to see what does apply, how does it apply to us? Exactly, Ray. Oh, let's see. You have a lot of buttons to have to push. <laughs> I, I, do. I, to have I told you, you do a great <laughs> job, Ray. Thank you, Ray. <laughs> Well, uh, you guys all went to different areas, but I love the way that Troy was talking about. He showed in the Bible that you have you have the command and you have the example right there in the verses he just looked at. So then where does the necessary inference come from? I do what you did and go to a different verse, though, when you talk about collection, the collection of the saints, mm. right? We have the command mm -hmm. that you are to collect, uh, lay by in store so that you have it whenever it's needful, uh, that it's already been collected. Then you have the example that they collected upon the first day of the week. So you have a command and an example. Well, what do you do when you collect everything? Where do you put it? Right? That's where the necessary. At the apostles' feet. <laughs> yeah, <No. laughs> that's where the necessary inference comes in. What do they do with the money once it once it's collected? Right? Do we have trays that we pass around in most congregations today? You had uh, Judas, whenever he was with Jesus as a disciple, he carried the money bag, right? So you have, where do you put it? Where does it get collected at? That's where the necessary inference comes in. And it's just a logical thing that this needs to be done this way. And it, it can be done a number of different ways in that particular example. But you have to necessarily infer that something has to be used to collect the money. But you can't violate another command. I mean, that's a great example. Right. You can't violate another command uh, and and go beyond. And that's where, you know, uh, one of the criticisms I see a lot of time about CENI hermeneutics is that the necessary inference sometimes gets abused. Yes, absolutely. I mean, uh, because, you know, take mechanical instruments or music. Some people would say, well, you know, the piano is just uh, necessarily inferred. No, it's not. You know, there is a type of music that is called a cappella music, <laughs> and you don't have to have music with accompaniment. So to say it's necessarily inferred, no, it's not necessarily. But um, there could be situations that we could discuss. <laughs> I don't want to go open tons of cans of worms here, but um, you know, this idea that uh, Ruth Williams said she was baptized. I in saw that. Trough. That's great. Awesome. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, uh, that sometimes perhaps we do go too far uh, in using necessary inference to try and justify things. Oh, absolutely. It's, you can see it in several different things that's happened in history just in the last 10 to 15 years with some of the interpretations that people have made.
All right, Marilyn, go ahead and open the can of worms for us. Throw uh, it up there. That's a good you question. Know. It, it is. It is. Okay. I like it. What do you think about giving online? All right, it's a Bible question, Bible answer. Um, I'm just going to say this as far as giving. You know, th- th- this question comes up whenever it comes to um, the idea of checks because a lot of people want to argue about like checks you know, back in the day. Well, if I write a check, am I actually giving on Sunday or not? <laughs> that's a good point you know that's a good point um and, and then people have opposed about like purposing in their heart and the idea of um you know that if you just set up an online and it just comes out automatically are you purposing in your heart or not and i see where they're coming from on that and uh i think there's some, some difficulty you know i don't think we need to pass a credit card reader around the church building in order to be able to give with our debit card and it it could be a very real thing i know some people talk about like our currency today might not be the same currency we have in 50 years there you go that's and that's so when we expediency when we yeah. think about this question before we give it a bible answer let's not just give it by the answer of what we are understanding today because i've seen a lot of stuff that is supported about whether or not we're even carry coins and paper in the future because of the digital world mm-hmm. so if we are completely digital uh in a currency could you biblically give digitally online what would your answer be then you'd have to if that's the modern form of currency is digital mm-hmm. whatever Right, You know, that the, you don't literally have dollars and coins. And so if I'm going to take that stance, I almost have to take that stance today that it would be a means by which is approved of God. Now, let me say this. I think there's something about the gathering together and that if it's, if it's an act of worship, giving our heart and doing it in the assembly, not just this, I've set it up and it happens to come out every first, whatever you know, on the bank account. Right. I think there's an act that you are participating in the worship service. And so that's what concerns me. Yeah. There, that's the, one of the key things about expediency is understanding it, what it is and expediency cannot change the command. So what is the command? The command is you, we are to give. And so as long as we are fulfilling the command, without altering it or changing the command. But the idea the means, is to give whenever you come together on I the first day of the week. Wasn't arguing that part. I'm just I know saying it, the, I command, know the command. <laughs> the command. So depending on what what situation is available or what tools are available, you know, that's like expediency the way I explain it is, for example, Noah was commanded to build an ark. Well, how? Is, is it okay if he used, I mean, would it be okay today? to use cranes and power tools and things like that. You know, back then he didn't have that. He had hand tools. That's what we're talking about here. Yeah. The tools by which we're able to do it. Mm -hmm. I can't say giving digitally is wrong. I see it as a part of when the church comes together. First Corinthians 16, one and two, just to qualify that. And it's to be done with the heart. No doubt. Second Corinthians nine. One of the things I saw recently is whether or not, we lost the purpose of this when the pandemic came around. Cause did you notice how many people were quick to dismiss the assembling, but they were very quick, <gasps> drop your contributions off, give online. And, and it's like, all of a sudden that <laughs> part of our worship got elevated. I used to hear people about elevating the, the part of worship of the Lord's supper above the other acts of worship. I saw recently a lot of congregations elevating the act of, Um, togetherness when it came to the financial giving more than they did about the communion uh, together. I think I got the answer. Yeah. So when we get to that digital age where it is no more coins, no more checks and all that stuff, what we can do is when we stand up there, instead of passing a plate around, we just ever, we just ask everybody to pull out their phones or whatever. mm -hmm. And then after they say the prayer, then everybody just reaches over and pushes the button. <laughs> we can have card readers, yeah. little scanners in the pews. Buttons or something. Yeah. You know, I mean, and it's hard to think about that, but yeah. it, the point I would want us to take away from this is when, when we give these answers, let's try and think beyond the now and think about mm-hmm. the issue at hand. Yeah, and what right. is the deep issue? The deep issue is you're commanded to give, right. and you're supposed to do, you're supposed to purpose within your heart 
And that's real important. So and if it's a part giving, of our worship, it needs, our it corporate needs to worship. remain part of our corporate worship. Right. Yeah. It's the underlying principle. You can't that's change. Right. You can't change the command. Right. So the, the, the method of doing it, you know, singing, you know, we use microphones now. I remember whenever PowerPoint first came out. Oh man. I mean, Liber- that was the liberals. They, <laughs> that was the work of the devil for a lot of people. That, hey, I, I had to fight that at a congregation. Whenever it's, I, I had people, uh, that, that's entertainment. Yeah, we, I, we I can, heard we the same. That. I heard the same thing. But you know what? You go to a lot of those places now, and they don't want to do without it because it helps them see the words, helps them understand the points and things like they that. They realize that. it's an expedient it's to a, fulfill a, a command. Tool. It's a tool to fulfill the command yeah. of. In many cases, reading scripture or the, the preaching and things like that, songs. Right. Let me also say it though, it enforces. It when right. in doubt, though, just don't do it. There you go. It, better to yeah. be safe. Better to be safe and be right. Yeah, I mean, if and some of it's doing it of faith. If somebody doesn't want to, if they're not <laughs> comfortable with the giving on online, then then don't give online. Um, if, if the check bothers you. I mean, if you say, hey, they used coins in the New Testament and you want to go get the coins, poor Ray, when he has to count it, and make the deposit. But you know what? Get those two mites, you know, make sure you get those. <laughs> Is that all I have to give? <laughs> no, I'm just saying, make sure you use those because that's what the poor use widow the did. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, but um, I'm, I'm going to get coins with Caesar on them. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> Not, you're supposed to render that to Caesar. No. Oh, yeah. Um, uh, listen, here's while we're on the subject, I want to add something that uh, my wife and I have worked out is it just dawned on me one time as we was thinking about within the heart and stuff like that that uh you know i was writing out the check and i mm-hmm. was taking care of everything and i was putting it in there and it dawned on me i wasn't allowing andrea to do my wife to do her part in worship i was denying her her part and so now what mm-hmm. we do is when the plate comes to us we're both right there and she now even if i write the check actually she writes the checks today but if I write the check, give it to her or vice versa. That way we're both participating in that act of worship. How about that? I never really thought about that before. I'm not saying everybody has to do that. I'm not not binding that on anybody. I'm just saying think. The point being is think about your worship and make sure that you're doing it purposing this, in your heart. This is one right. that's actually caused me trouble. Uh, if you're l- l- wondering about my laughing just a minute ago, I got a cramp in <laughs> oh, my <what>? leg. <laughs> But the best part was nobody could see your face because you were looking away oh, from the camera. Man, it was, I, I we were trying not to laugh. I was so. thinking about, was something funny said? <laughs> no, I got a cramp behind my knee. It was knee. more of a grimace then, yeah. Yes, it was bad. But anyway, yeah. <laughs> um, you know, I, I've struggled with that because, like, I get yeah. paid uh, once a month. And I don't like the concept of being tempted. Um, you know, I believe in the first fruits principle that I give first to God. And mm-hmm. I purpose that amount, and I give that at the first of the month. And, um, cause I want to make sure, you know, if the month gets tight, that's okay. I can eat a lot of Vianna sausages, you know, I, I'll be fine, but I'm not going to be tempted to, to take that, which I have purposed in my heart. And so I give that at the first of the month. And then when I thought about that, I was like, well, you know, I'll, I'll put a little bit more in the plate on Tuesday, um, Tuesday <laughs> on the second on Tuesday, <laughs> I don't know the <laughs> second Sunday, the third Sunday, fourth Sunday. But then I'm like, but wait a minute, am I doing that to be seen of men just because I don't want people to think I'm not giving? But then I get worried that if I don't do that, then I'm like, but I don't want to be a stumbling block somebody else. <laughs> and, yeah. But see, that goes back to the point of right. thinking about your part in worship. And you know, that's, that brings up another point when we're talking about worship. Yeah. You know, how many people, I know some who do, but how many people actually prepare themselves for worship before you ever even get to the building, before you ever walk in and sit down and get started? How, how, Are you talking about ironing your shirt? I'm not talking about ironing your shirt. That is an important part. Yeah. But I, most, I knew you weren't. But. The most important part is what? Preparing your mind, preparing your heart. One of the things we do at our house years ago is I made a policy on Sunday mornings. We don't play video games. I say we, my sons. <laughs> <laughs> because, I mean, any other day that they want to get up in the morning early, they want to play video games, that was fine. You know, they could, um, they could do that. But I said, you know what, Sunday morning – We're going to focus more about that. We're getting ready to go worship God. Uh, My wife, one of the things she does is that she will listen to um, uh, spiritual songs, uh, acapella, uh, that she finds on YouTube, and she'll listen to those. Uh, One of the things I'll do uh, to get ready for worship, since uh, we weren't having Bible class for a little while, 
uh, I can't do this anymore is I, I would tune into Margaret street online. Cause y'all are an hour ahead of us or so. And I'd listen to you preach to help get myself ready for worship, being prepared. So there's a lot of things you can do to get that frame of mind, your heart ready. Or WFGX, two hours of Christian broadcasting. I was wondering how long it was going to take to segue. Oh, okay. well, <laughs> that was a great segue. Yeah, okay. Starts <laughs> at 7 through 9, yeah. And, you know, I get lots of comments about that, by the way. Uh, people love that, and uh, they get a lot, that's how they prepare. I, I know a lot of people, that's how they prepare is by watching those programs. Mm-hmm. And, you know, live stream stuff is so good, but, you know, I've had these discussions of, you know, when does something become not an expedient? Because just because something is authorized doesn't mean that it's good judgment in order to do. Okay. Um, and, and what I'll say is one of the things, if a congregation sees members getting to the point that they want to assemble with Christians because in their mind they can just sit at home and watch a worship service mm. rather than to reciprocate the relationship that's supposed to go on in an assembly, it could get to a point that it might not be an expedient thing to keep offering that. Hey, we got five minutes. Can we talk about that a little bit more? Oh, I'd love to because there's a lot of people after the pandemic that are, they have in their mind that they're just fine sitting at home, even though they're failing, they have turned their back upon the assembly, which is exactly what Hebrews chapter 10 not forsaking the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is, because it's in that assembly, it says that you're supposed to be provoking one another and love good works. Yeah, and that's the key to that verse, by the way. A lot of times that verse is used, uh, you know, to point out that's a sin that you're not there. Well, you're missing the point. The point is that provoking, there's a reciprocal. Listen, God designed the worship service for a reason. And Ephesians 5, 19, 3, 6, Colossians 3, 16 we're not singing to each other when you're sitting at home and you're, and you're singing along with TV, you're not doing anything to help me as your brother in Christ. Uh, all you're doing is watching that reciprocating relationship. Oh, good um, point. Okay. Uh, on that. I see where he's going with that. Well, the other thing too, is that, yeah, listen there, we can certainly defend what was happening during the pandemic. You know, we, we didn't have choices and, and we did the best we could in regards to trying to keep people spiritually fed. Uh, I think we, we, you and I talked about this, a live stream could be considered that of receiving a letter from an apostle. Yeah, but, but not a the, replacement. Exactly. It's the teaching that you were getting. You weren't replacing worship. That's the key thing. What people forget often is that worship is not for your benefit. I mean, it is. You get a benefit out of it, of course, but what is the real purpose of worship? What is it? Ray, I see you pointing fingers over there what do you mean brother <laughs> gotta turn my mic on there you go guy yeah. doesn't touch it anymore delay <laughs> uh, <laughs> sorry I, I was pointing to uh the sky the worship is not about us it's about giving glory to god and honor to him and coming together to remember everything that he has given us mm-hmm. the worship is about him that's exactly right and I'm, you being there what does that show it's a manifestation of your love to god yeah i think it's a twofold thing Okay. Because what I will say is, you know, that assembling is for the purpose of worship, that we're offering this together to him. But there's still the byproduct of what we are doing for each other in that worship. That's right. I mean, the communion, the communion, the whole purpose of that. First Corinthians communion. chapter 11. Common it, union. You can't sit at home, take communion, and I sit somewhere else, take communion, and say, oh, we're doing that together. No. Uh, that, that, that defeats the whole concept of what he teaches in the idea of coming to the table being together yeah, I, I don't know anybody in their right mind that says if i eat here and you ate a dinner at home watching me eat that we ate dinner together <laughs> again we're you know we're just trying to point out something here that there was unique circumstances we had to deal with but now that we're getting past that we're trying to remind in this conversation and what i hope to achieve was remind people the importance of worship the importance of coming together to worship and don't let live stream and things like that be a substitute understand sometimes you have to use it but it we are coming out of that where we can now be back together if a person's heart is hey i'm sick at home i can't be there or i I was out of town one time i had worshiped on the sunday but i knew milestone service was on the live stream well, I wasn't worshiping with them in my hotel room because I'm going to be honest with you. You're being I, spiritually fed. But I was receiving spiritual encouragement. That's right. 
and in my hotel room while I ate my Reuben sandwich from McAllister. And that's what it's for. It's for that. Well, thanks for letting us talk about that. We're mm-hmm. about out of time and very, very thankful. It's to a have... fun thing to talk about, though. <laughs> it, it, what's yeah. funny is people I, I don't get like out of here to talk about you're starting, it. You're starting to get worked up, and I don't want to well, get you see, see, you get worried, <laughs> Troy, about me. But, um, you know, I'm going I'm to I'm end it on this, mark, this comment. People don't need to try and justify actions because of what they did. I think if people will just stop now, uh, sometimes there's battlefield decisions that get made that when people will look back, they'll be like, huh, we did the best we could at the time with the, in the midst of the battle, mm-hmm. we can do better than what we did. There you go. And if they could honestly look at that, I think we could see elderships preparing for the next time we face something like that yeah. rather than just being quick to dismiss and justify. Good point. All right. Hey, uh, we're going to end it there tonight. Troy, great to see you. Good Always to see is. you, brother. It was good to see you, Jeff. No, I'm, it was great to see you too. Same here. Okay, good, great. I get it. All right, all right uh, Ray, good <laughs> to see you tonight. We're going to see you all next week for our two-hour program uh, right. in a week. See you then.